So we've seen that science evolves, improves by cycling through paradigms. Uh, so you have periods of normal science where one paradigm is extensively used by everybody, is refined, developed, and um, at some point, once too many anomalies have accumulated, you have a period of revolutionary science when different paradigms compete with each other. And so to understand a bit the outcome of uh, these periods of revolutionary science and also to understand how you know, paradigms are, uh, are created, um, it's important to understand what are the qualities of a good paradigm, because this is going to help us understand why it's one paradigm that's going to emerge uh, victorious from this period of revolutionary science. And so it helps us make sense of the evolution of different uh, scientific fields. And then once we apply this little model of science to macro, it will help us understand the evolution uh, of um, short-term uh, macro uh, of business cycle research. So what are the qualities of a good paradigm? Uh, and here, uh, Kuhn again helps us a lot because you know, we spend a lot of time defining paradigm, but also isolated what are the, what are the key qualities of a good paradigm. So the first quality is that, uh, and, and there are three of them. So the first quality that, that uh, Kuhn talks about is uh, precision, accuracy. Basically, you want a paradigm that describes well the world uh, around you. So we know that scientists are looking at a set of uh, facts and a good paradigm has to be descriptive. He has to be able to capture uh, and explain all these facts that have been collected by the scientist. Uh, so in the case of astronomy, uh, which is what uh, Kuhn uh, talks about in the Copernican Revolution, you know, these facts have to, be, have to do with the movement of the stars during the night, uh, the movement of the stars over the season, the length of the day, the movement of the sun uh, during the day, over the season, the movement of the sun in different places on the Earth, um, all these type of, of stuff. So, you know, scientists, astronomers that have been, you know, they had accumulated facts about the motion uh, of all the bodies that are in the skies. And so a good paradigm should, you know, uh, had to be able to describe and explain as many of these facts as possible. So that's one. Your paradigm has to be descriptive. And, you know, when you learn about science, actually, usually the emphasis is only on that quality. When we learn about science and when we learn about theories, we just think that, you know, what we're taught in school is that, oh, your theory has to explain, you know, uh, basically, you know, a theory has to be the truth. And so it has to explain all the world, uh, you know, all the, round, all, all the world uh, around us. But of course, you know, no, <laughs> no theory on the model is, is true in any, in any way. Uh, models and theories are just, you know, articulation of the knowledge um, part of the knowledge that has been uh, that has been collected um, and but so one of the quality of a good paradigm is that it can explain a lot of that knowledge but that's not all there are two other um, qualities and these are things that are uh, mentioned much less uh, when we think about science so the second quality is that um, a good paradigm has to be economical uh, and that means that it has to be um, simple it has to be a simple logical explanation for a large set of facts. So if, if you want the, the paradigm has to be uh, an aid to the memory of the scientist. It has to be a simple logical scheme that can summarize you know, a very long list uh, of facts. Um, so that's, uh, that's a second very important quality. And it's not necessarily directly related to the first quality of being descriptive. So, for instance, if we think about the old uh, geocentric view of the universe, you know, with the Earth in the middle and then the planets rotating around the Earth and then the final sphere on the outside where all the stars are. So we know that that's not 
a good description of the universe. We know that the Earth is not at the center of the universe. Nevertheless, that old paradigm was very economical. Um, it's a very simple representation uh, of the universe, and um, and for for that reason, you know, it was you know it was a very popular uh, paradigm. In fact, Kuhn has a nice illustration. Um, so you can see the whole paradigm, the whole uh, system could all be summarized with this diagram, with the Earth in the middle, and then the, that's the first sphere, and then the second sphere on the outside where all the stars were located. Um, and then you can see as another diagram that shows where the planets were located. Um, so you have the Earth in the middle, and then all the planets in the solar system that are, uh, are you know, rotating around the Earth, and then you have the stars. So this is a very economical representation of the universe. Just with two diagrams, you can, you know, you represent the whole universe. And then from these two diagrams, as Kuhn shows, you can back out all the facts that were known to astronomers in the antiquity and all the way to the uh, Middle Ages. And in fact, the point that Kuhn makes that even today, people uh, continue to use uh, this old geocentric uh, system of the universe to do all kinds of calculation um, because it's, you know, we know that it's not as accurate as a Copernican system, but nevertheless, there are a number of things that it can explain and it's very simple to remember and to keep in your head. Um, so that's another quality that a system, uh, a good paradigm must, must have. It must be economical. It must be something that helps you remember a large number of facts because you have your little diagram in your head. So in, the, in that case, I showed you, you can have your little two, your two spheres in your head with the Earth and the, and the stars and the planet. And then from that, you can back out all the facts that were known uh, to scientists at the time. Um, so that's the second quality. The third quality that Kuhn talks about for uh, a paradigm after being descriptive and being economical is that it has to be uh, fruitful. And that what that means is that it has to be a good uh, guide to the unknown. It has to make uh, good, useful predictions about things that we haven't seen yet. Uh, so, you know, at any point in time, there are a number of things that have been observed and a good paradigm should explain uh, all of these things when it's descriptive, but there are also many things that haven't been observed, many things that scientists haven't looked at, either because they never thought about looking at them, because they didn't have the right instruments. Um, so there's a lot of things that's still unknown. And a good paradigm should make prediction about what, how these things look like, how these things might behave. And furthermore, a paradigm may also, may also point to in certain direction and say, hey, we should look at this we should look at that property, we should look at that behavior, we should look at that object because we, you know, the paradigm make predictions about this. Um, so in the case of astronomy, again, what Kuhn explains, for instance, is that um, Columbus would never have you know, left Europe to try to find America if it, wa you know, if it wasn't uh, for the geocentric uh, system. And in fact, this old geocentric system made prediction about the size of the Earth and how long it would take to uh, sail all around the Earth. It also made prediction about how the stars should look like in the southern hemisphere, which is you know, something that people had never seen in the northern hemisphere. Um, so when Columbus embarked in his, uh, on his trip to try, uh, you know, well, uh, to try to go uh, to India, uh, he had all this guidance from the old geocentric system about how the sky should look like and how long it should uh, take him. Now, of course, one issue is that because the geocentric system, you know, was <laughs> uh, was inaccurate, he thought, you know, they thought at the time that the Earth was much smaller than it actually is. And so, you know, they thought that they could get there uh, much quicker than they actually did. Uh, well, in fact, they never got to India, but, um, you know, the, they thought that the uh, circumference of the Earth was much smaller than what it was it actually was. But nevertheless, the system provided some guidance about how the world should look like, you know, in places where uh, these people had never been, uh, all these explorers had never been. Magellan, same thing, was also guided by um, the geocentric system. So a good paradigm, on top of being descriptive and economical, should also be uh, a good guide to the unknown. It should make interesting and useful prediction for things we've never seen. And of course, once we do see these things 
that the padding talks about once we do evaluate the prediction that the padding make that the padding makes and well these predictions are accurate fantastic there's nothing to do and if this there are some inaccuracies then uh, once this inaccurate observation have been uh, have been made then people go back to the theory and try to improve the theory and the model to uh, be consistent with this new observation and then and then once the model has been extended and improved makes new uh, is going to make new predictions about other things and then these things are going to be observed and evaluated and then you have this constant you know cycle between observations and models that constitute uh, normal science um, so these are the three qualities of a paradigm and so it's useful to know them being a descriptive economical and a good guide to the unknown uh, to understand how different science, scientific fields evolve and also to think critically about um, you know the paradigm that are uh, prevailing uh, in your field it's always good to uh, keep in mind that this is kind of the the gold standard this is what we aspire to to have a paradigm that uh, check uh, all these three uh, boxes